Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm Paul Dulgdick. I'm the Chief Executive of State Library Victoria. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you here to the 2023 Local Word, Local Word Writers Festival and today's In Conversation with author Gregory Day. Gregory will discuss his latest book, The Bell of the World, with fellow local, local writer Harriet Gaffney. I start by acknowledging the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation and the Gulijan and Gadabunud peoples of the Ma nations as the original owners of the lands on which these libraries and their services operate. We pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and we acknowledge and celebrate First Nations peoples of this land as the custodians of learning, literacy, knowledge and story. So I'm delighted to be with you today at this incredible event and, and great to see how it's thriving and uh, celebrating local talent and giving readers and writers the chance to gather as a community. Literary events and festivals are essential components of a healthy arts and culture scene, offering space for public debates and discussions. They provide a platform for writers, poets and other literary artists to showcase their work and engage with their audience, which helps to raise the profile of local writers within the broader community. And as we know, such opportunities can be few and far between for writers. It can be a very solitary pursuit and building communities that support and foster local talent is critical to supporting them. And it's just as important to build communities of readers, like yourselves, to encourage people to read more and to explore different genres of literature, which is also a key objective of libraries. Now, libraries have always been about connecting people with books and literacy. They're also great uh, enablers of knowledge, sharing and learning. And hosting events like this um, are critical and central to that ethos. Now, public libraries are a true democratising force in our society, making learning and knowledge free for all. Um, there are more than 280 public libraries in Victoria, and one of my favourite stats is that there are more public libraries in Victoria than there are McDonald's. <laughs> so I hope you think that's pretty cool. As I, as I travel around Victoria, I sort of think, oh, there's a McDonald's, oh, look, there's a library. Um, I think the ratio is there's 20 more libraries than there are McDonald's, so let's, let's keep going, guys. Um, and uh, those libraries have been uh, really showing their resilience over the last few years in, uh, in COVID, but also um, having recently visited Echuca and um, places like that that have undergone floods and just seeing the incredible um, services that are provided by libraries in times of crisis. At the State Library, we're proud to work closely with the Victorian public library sector to support those libraries across Victoria with community programs in health and wellbeing, in literacy, in First Nations engagement, and so on. Um, and also to increase awareness of the social and economic value of public libraries. And we were just saying in the Green Room how important it is to make sure that our decision makers, our policy makers, and can I say our funding bodies, understand the values, uh, the value of libraries to communities and really help people understand the, the contemporary nature of that as well. Thank you to Geelong Regional Libraries for everything you're doing to build such a vibrant community here in Geelong and also to show what uh, critical role libraries play more broadly. So now it's my great pleasure to welcome Gregory Day, a local writer who probably needs little introduction to you. Gregory is a writer and musician uh, living on Wadawurrung Tabale in the eastern Otways region of Victoria. He's published six novels and won many awards, including the Australian Literature Society Gold Medal. Gregory's novel, A Sand Archive, was shortlisted for the Miles Franklin Award in 2019. And in 2020, Gregory received the Patrick White Award for his ongoing body of work. And in 2021, he received the Nature Conservancy Australia Nature Writing Prize. And Gregory is in conversation today with Harriet Gaffney. With more than 20 years experience as a professional arts administrator, project officer and teacher, Harriet Gaffney is also an award-winning writer. She has an MA in creative writing and is currently working on a novel for her PhD. She freelances as a literary professional for festivals and organisations in Australia and beyond. Please join me in welcoming Harriet and Gregory. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Paul. I will say that novel has been sitting in the drawer for a while now. Uh, a real job sort of took me over. But anyway, 
But also thank you, Paul, uh, for the always inspiring work of the State Library of Victoria in continuing to connect Victorians with the people, places and ideas that make us past, present and future. I too would like to pay my deep respects and gratitude to the Wadarung, uh, Wadarung people of the Kulin Nations, the, tr the traditional owners of Jilang, and also to the Gadabanud and Gulijan of the Eastern Ma Nations, country which I have the pleasure of living and working on. As the first creators on and of the lands and waters that Gregory has written so exquisitely about, Perhaps nowhere more beautifully, I suggest, than in this, his latest work, The Bell of the World. It is entirely fitting that we take this time to acknowledge the extraordinary fortune we have as Australians to call this place home. <coughs> Excuse me, I haven't spoken to anyone else all day. An entire continent that has been nurtured, cared for and loved in the most profound way by people that understand her as the most precious, vital and important component of life itself. And so to Mr Gregory Day and the Bell of the World. Greg, I'm going to be bold and state that I believe this book heralds a new pan-Australian literature, one that closes the gap between past, present and future and that paves the way for every Australian to embrace as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have for more than 80,000 years now, the local place as the end to all arguments about what should be or what could be on this continent. But before we take a deep dive into the world of the book as text, would you give us, for those in the audience who haven't yet had the opportunity to read it, uh, a brief setup? What is the novel about? <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome and thanks for coming. Um, thanks Harriet and thanks Paul. Um, just on the topic of libraries before I get to that, I just wanted to say, I, one of the things I do is coach football and uh, I was at a final this morning in Port Arlington, I was coaching the forwards in this particular team and I always wear a badge that says libraries, saves demo libraries save democracy and I just happened to have this badge on and I'm talking to the team at the quarter time, three quarters of breaks, and sometimes I just see one of these young under-18 under 18 boys in the middle of a football game just look at my badge <laughs> and they think, what? And just see them ticking over. So there's all kinds of ways to spread the word. Um, what's the book about? Um, <clears throat> I think what this book for me is is coming from this idea that every dawn is an anniversary of the beginning of everything, which had no beginning anyway. Um, and so the main character of this book, Sarah Hutchinson, is uh, a conduit for that polytemporal, if you like, timeless thing. Um, it's ostensibly a, a historical novel set around 1910 and 1959, but really she is a character who kind of um, can conjure most times or all time, if you like. So even though it's set within the furniture and some of the cultural furniture of that time, it's also she has access to our present time now. And, and so it's, it's a dream and it's a song as much as it is a novel. And I suppose for me that's what a novel is. It's not... Uh, an essay, it's not a polemic, it's not a history book, it's, it's a dream and a song. So um, that's really what the book is and it's, a, it's the story of a young woman kind of learning how to be here and then with her uncle, Fernie, on uh, a farm down, in the, down near where I live, down near the border of Wadarong and Gadabanud country, um, it's about them understanding the trying to understand and then learning how to be in this place and how that that way of being clashes and harmonizes with the society and people around them but more than anything it's about listening to the place where we are and the bell of the world as the title refers to the sound of place and the sound of the place itself before we ring any cultural bells um, let's listen to the bell that's already ringing here 
Well, thank you for just basically taking us right through the entire conversation, everyone. We've finished a bit early. <laughs> no, we haven't. But um, I'm going to take us... So I'm, we'll extrapolate a little bit further on quite a few of those ideas as we go on. But I remember seeing Alex Miller at the Ubud Readers and Writers Festival in about 2011, I think it was, after the publication of Autumn Lang, his novel about the life of Sunday Reed. And... Alex was telling a story about how Autumn came to him. She sprang upon him one, one afternoon when he was sitting in one of those lovely sort of fenced-in squares in London and he was watching a, a squirrel and suddenly she was sitting beside him and in her very sort of strident voice speaking through him. And he said that she arrived, you know, fully fledged in that he hadn't really written the book that it had written him. When I read this book, right from the very start, I think, I had this same sense in reading The Bell of the World that, Greg, you couldn't have actually have, have stopped the book coming to fruition or forming the way that it did, that absolutely everything that you have seen and done to date has led to this, that the book was born of you, but also that in some ways it birthed you like one of the million spores spread from the earth star fungi that the lead character, Sarah, becomes fascinated with later. Um, I will get to a question. As noted in Paul's introduction, you're not only a writer but a musician, and Sarah is likewise a composer. There's a particular syntax and cadence to the language of the book that goes beyond the functionality of words lined up on the page. Um, it is both literal and narratival, but it's also music in its reach. And I deliberately don't say it's musical. I, I believe that it transcends actually to the point where it is like the bell of the world. There is definitely a song to it. It immerses us from the very first moment in a world that's so vivid it is beyond that language, intuited. So it brings me back around to the question of what influence did music have on the writing of the book and, and could you have written this book had you not been a musician? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question because for me, in my life, music and writing on the page have just been symbiotic all the way down the line. And I've interchanged between the two of them my whole life. And then in the last maybe five to ten years, I've done less public singing and made less records. And that's just through the practicalities of life, having children, various things about family life. You know, touring in a musical sense is not necessarily compatible with that. So what I noticed was that that impulse in me to sing, the musical impulse, had to go somewhere. And eventually I think it's gone onto the page as well. And that's something that I kind of have been aware of my whole life. You know, I'm, my family are Irish and Sicilian, both very musical cultures, and I've been aware of literature as music as well. But this started to happen just for me in a more authentic way, I think, just that musical side of me, which wasn't getting an outlet there, had to go there. And so that meant that the usual way, like we live in a time perhaps where it's more fashionable to write lean and minimal sentences with a simple clarity to them. So this is quite Baroque, if you like, in compar comparison to that. And that's because there's, yeah, that's part of my system. So it had to go somewhere. So I think that's part of the, part of the reason for that, yeah. I might, just to give people sort of a taste or a sense of what we're talking about, I might ask you actually to read a passage if you don't yeah, sure. mind. Sure. So this is a passage, um, this doesn't give any of the plot away or anything like that. Um, it's Sarah Hutchinson in her house after she's been, once again we're in 1910, she's been to a, um, a, perform a magic lantern show, early form of technology at that time with the local community and she's come home to the homestead and she's in her room in the homestead. <clears throat> the field naturalists were due to leave the very next day. But that night, when we'd got back to the house after the Magic Lantern show, and long after everyone had taken quietly to their rooms, the naturalists, no doubt, writing up their field notes from the day, there was a knock on my bedroom door. 
I'd been preoccupied at my writing table, but not with writing. I'd been listening to the ocean. It had occurred to me as we walked home from Mr Hasty's guest house under starlight that the far off sound of the waves roaring in towards the river mouth was some kind of acoustic equivalent to the flecky, fluxing, scratched and stippled ambience engendered in me by the Magic Lantern Show. And so alone in my room, I'd been listening to the wild sound as if indeed I was looking at something. The ocean sonics were forming new pictures in my mind too, pictures which in turn resembled the wash of atmosphere that I often describe privately to myself as world music. On this occasion, as I sat there, my eyes wide open, but unseeing of the room, seeing instead the moving image of the sound of the ocean playing itself out upon my soul's emulsion, I thought I could detect a central key in which the sound was being played. The teeming harmonics of the far off sound as it traveled towards me over the league of the meandering valley appeared to consist of an infinite number of tones filaments of sonic pollen, really, that nevertheless issued forth an initiatory note and coalesced within the boundaries of a single unifying key. Amazed that such a deep singularity could exist in something so various and of the airs, I was sitting in a state of awesome fascination when the knock on my door came. So that just as I felt that I was myself climbing the night sky along with the sound, and reaching high in the assurance of a commonality of all things, as evidenced by this ocean key. The sound of knuckle on wood came as if from the imperative of gravity itself. My vision collapsed in less than an instant, and I felt suddenly pinned to the earth. The knock came again. But paralysed by the instant, I could neither speak in reply nor move to answer the door. As I say... I felt quite pinned. I did not so much wait then as hover in my chair, a planet between two very different moons. And thus I was both pinned and in suspension and only dimly aware of my semi-undressed state and of the fire of she-oaks still flickering in the grate. The knock came a third time and with this third knock I may have heard the faintest mention of my name. Whatever this additional sound was, it managed to completely dissolve the oceanic dimensions of my room. And when the fourth knock came, its foregrounding erased all sonic expanse so that you wouldn't even have known an ocean was ever there. In front of me, my writing paper, and suddenly I noticed it. It was bare in its sheath. The whiteness of the paper was alarming to me the way it extruded all other colours. The world indeed had become a blank page. I looked down at my nightgown as pale too as the page, but the skin of my small bosom was itself all blotchy red, undoubtedly from the excitement and now the tension of what I was experiencing. Apart from Fernie, no one had ever knocked on my door, ever, but now they had and were waiting as persistently as a hawk of sorts on the other side of the door. It was then I imagined for the first time opening the door onto a ruthlessly featured thing with piercing eye, a primary creature and full with intent. I made as if to move but did not budge an inch, I'm sure. But soon after, I was standing upright beside the writing table, my body pulsing as stars do above the ridge lines. And I was stepping across the floor the way a heron steps precariously across an exposed reef while knowing all the time what she is seeking. The cold touch of the brass doorknob matched the glint it reflected from the wavering light of the she-oak fire. The fire came and went with the wind. She-oak timber when cleaved open can be quite heath pink and now such colours of our surrounds, colours of the salt and sylvan place were fueling the glow of the room. And it was into that cleaved timber and candle glow that the hawk then entered, a creature with narrowed focus 
and outspread wings. Could I shelter there beneath those wings, I momentarily wondered, or will I be torn to pieces in my flesh? Or could I, a woman of my species and no mere maiden, somehow summon that ocean key and the fusing of a truly unforeseen moment into deep equivalence? In truth, such thoughts are as rapid in their vanishing as in their emergence. Yet though they are fleeting, the world is too dangerous without them. And with them, we are prepared for a great receiving, as when a physical touch silences the mind. Suffice to say that before long the ocean was roaring once again at the mouth. The night's moon-lured water went climbing into the sky, the stars falling into unrecordable depths. The sound suffused the room. Indeed, it was as if the room was the sound. And this unexpected visitor and I went transporting there, among it and of it, by wing and gill, on the smoke of centuries and the truth of blank pages, towards the dawn. When I read the first chapter of this book, it was a Sunday night or something, and I started about 11 o'clock thinking, oh, it's a big book, I'd better get onto this. And I read the first chapter and I was so... Uh, it was so vivid that I, I shot off a, an email to Greg saying, I just want to get in there and sit on the stage and then once everyone's settled, get the attendants to open up the doors and just make everyone feel for an hour. Because, as I think you'll note from that, I was watching some of you while he was reading and many of you had your eyes down and you were just absolutely sort of embraced by that language and, and taken up by it. And I think there's something to this entire book that, as I said to begin with, goes beyond the literal words lining up on the page. It, it takes you to a place that is of the weather and is of, you know, the greater world. Um, I'll move on, though, because I think that perhaps... Most of us, or all of us really here, except perhaps for First Nations people, have, you know, we, we've inherited the legacy of the Age of Enlightenment and imperialism and Darwinism, of course, and, and through those notions or that way of thinking, we're, we're very fond as a species of exceptionalism. We see ourselves as apart from the other species that make up our world and separate to it. And Sarah here, she's entered another space. What the great anthropologist W.H. Stanner referred to as the every when, when articulating First Nations cosmology. And this is something that Greg and I had a chat about a couple of weeks ago, uh, the space between I and thou, a space that is at once totally internal and external at once, significant and insignificant. I think it was at that same Ubud Writers Festival where I heard Alex Miller speak, Greg, that I was introduced to your work and I think it was there... I think you were there, was it for your first novel, The Patron Saint of Eels? No, it was The Grand Hotel. The okay, oh, of course, yeah. of course, yeah. 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 But what I do, so obviously I don't remember the title of the, no the book that he was speaking about, but what I do remember is that you clearly stating that sort of, you know, very Australian laconic way in the humidity of, you know, Ubud on an afternoon that it takes a lot of lying on the couch to be creative. Um, <laughs> if I can cast you back 12 or so years... What did you mean by that? And but to bring us into the present in this book, how important is entering the space of the every when to the creative process? And is it this that Sarah finds in Nangahook? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just a triple barred question, yeah. that one. Um, oh, look, well, I keep hearing this phrase in our culture. In I mean, it's I think it kind of started in corporate culture, but... This phrase of moving forward. Everyone's always saying moving forward. Um, now, this idea of moving forward, um, for me, I just can't help but see it as a bit problematic. We're moving forward, moving past stillness, for instance. Um, and even in, in, in terms of reading books, we're moving past um, the poetry of prose, if you like. So... The writer Lawrence Stern, who wrote The Life and Times, Life and Opinions of Sh Tristram Shandy, he once said, uh, 
Digression is the sunshine of life and the soul of reading. But we more and more are reading moving forward. So the rise of crime fiction and all these things, the popularity of that, Netflix and so forth, it's taking us past. In my experience anyway with songwriting or with uh, a book like this, the seeding, the germination of something like this doesn't happen in that mindset of moving forward. And it happens in a mindset that I don't really fully understand. But it's quick and it's slow at the same time. Mm. So um, what happens, I think, in the creative uh, moment is uh, a form of intelligence that can't be tracked. So it's like a seabird that you can't band the ankle of. It moves too fast and it can't be unstitched, if you like, like that. So that requires, it's not something you can really know. So I think if it's not something you know, it's something you have to have faith in. You know, you can only believe in something that you don't know. If you know it, it's not a matter of belief, like climate change. Mm. So there is a life commitment that comes into that for me. So, so from a very early age, for whatever reason, I kind of made that commitment to myself about that. And, you know, that's been all kinds of things for me. But I don't have a sense of this, this territory of the everywhere or um, this lying on the couch or this polytemporal thing being, being um, something that we can lose touch with. I think it's, it's how that volcano over there you know, the Yu Yangs and we're in Word of Yuong here, it's, it's how that comes to be. It's, it's, the, it's how the earth is made and it's how we, and we're of that, so we're no different to that. So, you know, that's, and we're, we're understanding, and there is an element of this book which is like an, there's an urgency about the music of the language because of climate change, because of the predicament we're in. And so to be back inside that, that space where things are made as opposed to designed, if you like, is, is, is important. And for me, it's not, it's, not, um, it's not something that I can do without, personally. Yeah. We'll come back to climate change and to that sort of experience of uh, the making and being made by, if I can put it that way. Um, but let's talk about Joe for a moment because he actually inadvertent, you know, in a very covert way uh, comes, you know, is brought into the into the space of the book in the passage that you read. Uh, he comes to Anglehook as a representative of the Melbourne Field Naturalist Group, yet his experience of country and the experience of the other field naturalists that he accompanies is extremely limited. What happens to him when he has the opportunity to spend time with Sarah and Fernie at Nangahook? Oh, yeah. There's another layer to this book too, is a kind of comic layer. Uh, I don't, I never trust a person who I meet that can't laugh. <laughs> I think it's a bit the same with a book. Um, so these field naturalists come to this place. Um, basically, Fernie is a, is a, uh, uh, a great, uh, a bit of an aristocratic enthusiast for all things and he's rather bored. And so his niece kind of tries to, revive him by arranging for this visit of field naturalists from Melbourne to come down and kind of do an audit of his property and he'll think that'll, she thinks that'll stimulate him. Um, but these field naturalists turn out to be, you know, um, not quite as open-minded as Fernie um, <laughs> and they're also hell-bent on statistical knowledge. So they're about collecting and counting species and in those days some of the field naturalists, not all of them, did that by actually killing the animals and then enumerating, including owls and all kinds of willy wagtails and anything. Um, and Joe is this young guy who's with them. He's kind of in their slipstream and he's part of the group, but he's really young and open and different to that. And when he arrives there, he's, in, he's within that culture of the field naturalists. Um, but he encounters Fernie for a start. Fernie's homosexual and Joe and Fernie are attracted to each other and... So things start to open up for Joe and 
they open up in, in himself, in his sexuality, but that is symbiotic with them opening up in terms of his relationship to species and how we, how we engage with these species around us that are part of us. So for Joe, it's, um, it changes his whole life, um, but it's not about politics, it's not about science, it, it changes his being. It happens for him sexually as well as as a naturalist. Mm -hmm. So there's no kind of division between those, those parts of him. And that makes for a few fairly comical episodes <laughs> within the scheme of the, of the novel, yeah. Um, let's move to the bell that some of the township's folk decide is needed in the town. What does it augur and why is Fernie so against it? So, yeah, the, um, one of the key plot points of the book is that um, some people in the town decide that the town needs a church bell to be civilised, if you like. Um, and so they're very morally pious about that and, and they come to the Hutchinsons, Fernie and Sarah because they are wealthy and they, they are philanthropists and they are used, used to coming to them to fund different things that happen in the district. So they come to Fernie um, to fund this bell which is, you know, as I say, meant to be kind of civilising what they call a savage landscape and so forth. And Fernie and Sarah, for slightly various reasons but, but in sync with each other, they refuse to fund this bell. And part of the reason why they refuse to fund the bell is because of this thing about, about understanding the place you're in before you come in and do your thing to it. There's history within that about bells being rung in this area in early days, which Fernie's family have an association with and which his family saw the misguided na notion of. And so Fernie and Sarah decide not in this case to be the generous philanthropists and say, we don't want this bell rung here. We want to hear the bang bell of the world. Now that sets them, that sets up a train of kind of generational events which puts them at odds with the local community. Not only is Fernie gay, not only is Sarah a very experimental musician and they're holding kind of concerts in their house, but also they've, Fernie and Sarah have resisted this imposition of this Christian bell in the, in the area. Mm -hmm. So that's the motif of the book. It's the plot, the kind of nub of the plot. It's also the the sonic motif uh, around which the book resonates. Mm. Yeah. Mm. The peel of the work versus that sort of... Uh, yeah. Uh, um, That's right. Conquest, you know, the... the yeah. Um, I'm, mm. I've deliberately, quite deliberately, not read any of the reviews that have been written about the book prior to this discussion, and that's really just a greedy refusal on my part to be taken away yet from my own engagement with it. But it does occur to me that some might read it as an historical novel, as you mentioned at the start, you know, you furnished it. There is a t you know, we are given a clear, t clear time indicators, both at the beginning and then later in the book. Um, however, sorry, are you, I've lost my space. So it's after mm. World War One, you know, the very beginning of the book, it's Sarah sort of, you know, just prior to and then after World War One, then when they she and Fernie arrive back from Europe, Sarah's been in England at school. Mm. And then again towards the end you indicate how many years have passed, as you as you noted, nineteen fifty-nine. At the same time, however, Sarah and Fernie both embody a spirit and a way of thinking that's very contemporary. The way they embrace, and I'm talking, you know, contemporary as isn't right now, the way they embrace the deep time of the region, their acceptance of the Wadarung as traditional owners. You use the word Wadarung with its contemporary, well, with its First Nations spelling. You know, mm. Wadarung is coming from sort of the first attempts by uh, English and German speakers to phonetically record of the township and their land. And, and Fernie and Sarah's understanding of that cruelty, the theft and erasure that has occurred was this a conscious decision on your part to blend time in this way and to make it the novel? I mean, really, the novel is ahistorical. Yeah. 
I'm glad you say that because that's, as I say, it's a myth. Um, it's a mythological space in some respects. Um, uh, it was kind of deliberate. I mean, this is my sixth novel, and I've written. Um, I mean, from from a creative point of view, and in this place, this place of the everywhere, everywhere. Um, eventually, you're trying to match the world that you're in. And my understanding of the world is not linear and it's, there's as much dream in my daily life as daily life in my dream. It's interchangeable. So I, I did want to make a book that was not gridded in that way. Mm. Um, but the other reason for that is because I, I do feel quite with... Mainly, be, I think, for me, selfishly, because of, I have children... I feel very urgent about the climate situation and what our disconnect, our abstraction and so forth. So I kind of wanted to write a book, and because my children are younger, I wanted to write a book that would give them hope, that would be something for the future, mm. to be something of a model, of a way of being um, within the landscape and to say that, you know, um, we all have this earthling inheritance within us let's not other that that connection with the earth let's let's understand that we all we all have it and so that meant that the book couldn't just be set there it had to be it's written now it's a con it's a coming and going between the consciousness of now and the events of then so that just seemed like a necessary thing and for me as a as a novelist formally speaking it's a little bit experimental in that mm, respect, mm. but that's interesting to me because that's part of the part of the what gets me going. You know, I never write the same book twice. All my novels are about the same area, but they're doing it in a different way. So there's a prism around the area, if you like, prism. Um, uh, so, so each time I write a book, yeah, a story takes hold, but form is content as well. And so I need to be excited in that way. And at this point in history, in the history of the Earth and history of our domination as a species um, of it, I do, as I said before, think we can't do without this, this mm. polytemporal space. Mm, mm. I, that's exactly why I sort of came to, to read it or to understand it, because I, I read it, I probably finished it about only about two weeks ago, but I really have been letting it gestate within me and my own thinking and, and more than cognition, um, it coalesce in me in that sort of intuitive sense that I had about it. And it is, you know, it is pan, it is beyond one time. And, and we, we're in a very, thankfully, I believe, we're really in a period where for the first time space is being created for the First Nations voice, I, I mean that in terms of novels, but hopefully we will mm. see that, you know. But um, there's also something about turning back, or always referring back to history, that this, what this novel, you know, white writers in Australia at this point in time writing about our place, they often, we get caught because the reality of that is that we have to look at white action. And what you've done so beautifully is engender hope by, you know, from this polytemporal space. You know, there's, it's absolutely understood the, the, that erasure that's gone on, the hurt and the loss. But at the same time, the everyone is so present because of your extraordinary... Re, you know, you revere, you revel in the natural world, the characters, because you are. I mean, I when Jeff, when Greg and I first were talking about it a couple of weeks ago, I just I was convinced it was hugely autobiographical, and in some ways, because of where you live and how well you know the place, there's that. You know, you know the biography of that place, but it, it was because of that. Mm. You can feel it from the very first page. You you feel you are, you know, you're reminded of what it's like to be a small child almost running around with, you know, that thing of small children, they're constantly taking their clothes off when it's freezing. You're always saying, put on another jumper or something. But that feeling of, you know, if you can remember back to the feeling of 
you know, warm skin against cold air when you were young or something. This, that's what this book, it invigorates you. Um, I listened to Stan Grant recite this poem by the First Nations poet, painter and philosopher David Muljali recently, which I'll just read. Once I was past and future, now I am only the present, today, the moment, and that is hard to bear, with no past, no future. And that's why I call it, you know, that it's, that's why for me it is pan-Australian because you've stepped beyond this division that would say, you know, black thinks like this, white thinks like this. Um, I'll come back to climate though because, you know, it's the third decade of the 21st century. It's become abundantly clear that uh, it's, an, it's a crisis and it's really urgent. Um, I found myself telling my 18-year-old the other day I really didn't think she should probably have children. Um, so it's really interesting to me that you've not chosen to approach this crisis. It, it's a very funny book. It's a delightful book. It's a book that invigorates you and instills you with hope and love for place. You know, that you've not chosen to approach this crisis through the dystopian lens. No, definitely not. Uh, that's like if I'm, once again, if I'm coaching a football team and someone makes a mistake... I don't go there and just, say, and just focus on the mistake. Yeah. I point out the mistake and then focus on all that other, all that other great stuff that that player is. You know, we, we have to know what we're trying to save here. There's a literacy issue, I think, with, with what we call the natural world. There's a literacy issue where we need to re-enchant and reconnect with the world that we are trying to save. I mean, Australia's so urbanised, but, you know, even within, as we know, even within urban, urban society, there's a lot to engage with. So um, that's part of the impulse for the book too. I really feel that, um, that thing that... Um, <coughs> a Kiro Wurong friend of mine talks about animals and how, how other species are family members... St Francis also talks about that. Thich Nhat Hanh also talks about that. Um, you know your family members, whether you like them or mm. not. We've got to get to know the family that we're in and we are interdependent with. So that's a huge part of why this book is the way it is. And I can't dump shit all over my kids. I can't say this is... You should be ashamed of your species... Because I don't believe it's the species. I believe it's the system, not the species. Mm. You know, in First Nations, people teach us that. It's not the species. It's this crazy, misguided enlightenment of the last 500 years. So I don't believe that... that I, I do believe we can change it. Um, I'm going to ask Greg one more question and then it's your turn. So I'll let you know that there are mics in the room. If you have a question... If you're going to be, have a short comment, we might let you get away with it. But we prefer questions. If you have a question for Greg, please just raise your hand. Um, I'll come back. So one of the... Um, and then we'll bring a mic to you and just wait for the mic because otherwise the people behind you probably won't hear. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, circularity. There are repetitions and mirroring throughout the book uh, in Sarah's first and last relationship in the wonderful madness of the bookbinder from Moorlap. Moorlap gets a look in, I love that. And, uh, and Fernie with his chosen book. In the way the space-time continuum is bridged from the first chapter towards the concert at the end. What does this circularity hint at? Ah, so time. Time is music. So clock, whatever. The time is, is the night sky and and the deep time of that, and it's patterned, it doesn't go out there towards a fictional destination called heaven, it's a circle and a cycle and a wheel, and anything that if you are going to make a work of art that, you know, would do what Cezanne would say, which is like, you know, nature is our guide or the world, then um, if you want to make something 
that is that measures up to that immensity and that complexity then pattern and circularity uh, look at the sand look at your veins your body everything is that so for me this is what I, I would uh, you know be a bit of a wanker and call biomodernism you know we need to reset our idea of what is modern and understand that it's it's not linear, it's cyclical, mm. so that's why the novel's built like that. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I did promise we'd open it up to questions. Is anyone... And I'll have to put my glasses on back now so that I can actually see you. Oh, there you are. There's one over here. Ah, we'll start down here because the mic is there and then we'll come to you. Hey. Hey, G'day. I hope that you can hear this. This is quite a weird question. Um, your patron, Saint of Eels, how much of that is you... And how much of it is sort of a vision of St Francis or somebody like that? Or is there somebody in your area that looks like that? Only because I ran into somebody who <laughs> fitted the image on your beach about a dozen years ago, late one day, <laughs> when I was travelling along the coast yeah. on foot. Yeah. And they, they wore a big uh, dark coat yeah. and uh, they looked like a priest yeah. who might be wandering around reading their office. Yeah, wow. Um, you conjured him. I, I, I conjured him, yeah. <laughs> um, there is a bit of... I always take it as a good sign if what you're doing is somehow got a premonition kind of quality to it. But no, it's not me. Um, it's not me. What, what that came from was... Uh, I've been through a long process over the years about how to write about this place that I love so much, not being Wadarong, not being Gadabanud, but being Irish, being Sicilian. So I kind of entered into this long process of studying my bloodlines, seeing what was available in my bloodlines, what I would intersect and inherit, and then somehow creating some connection with the place through that. So that book, which was my first novel, was me tapping into my Sicilian bloodline as a way to talk about the eels that I've spent my life catching in the river and letting go or whatever. So it was it was part of this journey I've been on to find a way to be here as a writer and as a singer. So um, that guy, Fra Ionio, was a visitation to me that I felt comfortable writing about. And um, and once again, that that Franciscan side of it, where you know animals, the interspecies thing is part of it. So um, that's where that came from. Not me. Yeah. Oh. So I've confused yeah. somebody that was alive with somebody in the book and I wonder, and I've never seen you before. So yeah. I'm not sure it was you. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, no. We have another question over here, lady with the red cap. If you could just wait for the microphone, please. Hi, thank you, Greg. Great to see you. I love all your books. Um, I especially love your language, incredible linguistic, that sort of just takes you to places that most other authors never do. So thank you for that. Is there a kind of meta-narrative from the patron saint of eels through all of your books? Could you tell us about that, please? Yeah, it's... Um, yeah. Like I said before, um, I was early on I was quite interested in Balzac and how he wrote, the French 19th century novelist, and he spent his whole life writing what he called La Comédie Humaine, the human comedy. So it's over a hundred novels, I think he wrote. He's a maniac. He drank a lot of coffee. <laughs> like, he drank a lot of coffee. Anyway, his was to make a portrait of his world. Um, this was realism, you know. And he would do it through a bunch of novels that was based around this geography, really. So I've, that appealed to me. So I never saw any of my books as standalone things. They are all like that. So it's not... Once again, it's not a meta-narrative, but it's like a cubism of sorts where they're all doing... They're all interdependent, commenting on each other, bouncing off things. There's traces, if you want to look, there's connections all through them in different layers where things reappear and disappear and so forth. So it's, you know, it's... It's, um, it's once again, like I said before, with the patron saint of eels and then going through... Um, you know, one of my books set in half in Crete, half on King Island, one set in the sand dunes in France and then here. It's trying to 
give some GPS, if you like, a positioning device. And it's been, I suppose, me just looking for a way to be in, in this place um, with English, which just floats on top, whereas, you know, here at least, Wadaron comes out of the ground and it's, it tells us where we are. English doesn't. But I love English and I love, you know, my inheritance is that. Even though my Irish family were not allowed to speak their language for 800 years in Ireland, I still love English. Um, so, yeah, it is all one thing. Nice to be able to say that too, thanks. But thanks. Any other hands in the room? Yep. Oh, no, no, the people behind you won't. We will, but yeah, okay. it's better for everyone. Thank, thanks. So it, it's clear that you're, I'm sorry, I haven't read your book, but I, you know, absolutely determined to, but I do know your, your reputation. Um, and uh, this uh, is really asking for advice. So it's clear that you're talking about existential and cosmological issues and they're very dear to your heart. And um, there's an urgency, as you say, uh, about your work. So how do you avoid not writing a polemic? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that is a big issue. As a craftsperson, yeah, yeah that's a big issue. Um, so that's, for me, in the end, I mean, I've had problems with... I, wrote, I spent three years in the early 1990s writing a novel about seabirds that I never finished. And the, I spent three years writing this thing. And the reason why I didn't finish was because in the end I realised, I'm just writing a polemic. This isn't a novel. What happens in a novel isn't what happens in an essay. It's, it's a different thing. And in the end, what I understand of that is it comes back to your, um, your relationship with... Um, the world around you, your own sense of superiority or judgment, if you like. Um, so characters in novels, for them, I think, to, at least for me when I'm reading novels, for me to engage with them, have to be full of contradictions. They can't be uh, a megaphone. If they are, they're not flesh and blood. So it's just a tract. And when I read a novel, one thing a novel can do in our highly distracted time, I think, is immerse us. You know, it's an amazing art form. It's spend hours and hours with this, if you read this book. So it's immer immersion. I, don't, I can't immerse in a novel where I feel like the, the character is just a 2D spokesperson for someone else. You know what I mean? So... You're, you're on guard against that, I suppose. And it's taken me, and I'm not saying I'm there yet, but it's taken me a long, long time because I have that tendency in myself, as you might have picked up, about preaching about stuff and going on about stuff. So you, as an artist, that's part of the difficulty of, you know, being able to get rid of yourself sometimes. So there's no... It's everybody... Uh, some, another writer might have the problem of not having an opinion and they, <laughs> they, they are just, you know, uh, equivocal or ambivalent about these things. So we all as writers have different temperaments that we have to cope with to achieve what we think a novel is. I'm mm. going to say too that I think that partly the way that you've avoided it is... You're like a parent in this, in that you have unconditional love. I think, you know, for me, when you asked that question, my gut response was love. How did you avoid writing a polemic? Is love, this extraordinarily deep love for place and people, you know, like, and, and the minutia of your lens. You know, it's such, it's, you know, the magnifying glass is out and you are creeping through dappled light and being whipped by salt and wind and things and, and you know, it's... And, the, and it's... The net is very contained. I mean, we do travel to Moorlap, which is delightful. Um, there's mm. a fair bit of shit in Moorlap. I mean that mm. literally. Um, and it's important, you know, to the book, but... 
you know, there's this 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 delight and this even you know when the weather is bad or the neighbours might be this or you know they at the heart of it is this great love. Yeah, well, that's probably true. Um, we've got time for a couple more questions. If anyone has any, I'm going to really encourage you. Well, you can keep thinking. I'm going to really encourage you to to buy this book. I, I think that that the point you made about language earlier is so true it's it's like when I met with Greg a couple of weeks ago you know one of the things that's so exquisite about it is that in every single paragraph you get caught by a line that's just perfection and the line is pure poetry and we talked when we talked last time we talked about them operating as portals almost that you know, you step in, you sort of, you know, you move beyond the, the literal space of where you're reading this book into this other world. And I think that the language, in some ways, the delight of it, it rushes you through. But then I'd also recommend that you spend some time allowing it to seep, you know, and that also you don't need to understand... I don't think you need to understand every word no. um, or every line. In, and, and to me that sort of brings back to um, the Patrick White Award and why that was so, you were such an excellent choice for that because this is a book that I know, I could go and read it again now and I've only finished it, you know, a couple of weeks ago. This is a book that I, I think we'll be able to return to, I know we'll be able to return to for decades and decades and find something new on each reading, you know. It's a big and beautiful book that, you know, you one will get delight from. One of the things with that, Harriet, one of the little minute things I wanted to do. I had a couple of moments where I opened up a novel I'd read and just flick through and look at a page. And I'd read a paragraph and think, to get anything out of that paragraph, you have to be, you have to have read the book. You have to have a, an understanding of the plot and the character. And I thought, I'd like to write a book where you could open any page and you wouldn't need that. So I suppose like a book of poems, really. But it has to exist as a plot, because I do like turning pages. But I did want to write something that you could open a page and there'd be something in language that would give you that little spritz. And that's what makes it transcend to the realm of music, I would say. You know, as, as we come towards... Uh, I'm meant to finish in three seconds. But for me, um, it's a great symphony of a book. You know, Greg's, Greg's mentioned it or talked about it as a song, but to me it's greater than an individual song and it's one of those rare works of art that gives succour and hope, comfort whilst never shying away from the light or the oceanic dark of the personal, the political place and time. Um, it's a great symphony of a book that dares to say I love and I feel and so, so much more than that, that we as a species love and feel too. Feel with me, you know, um, and you can't help but feel with this book. So everyone, if you'd all please put your hands together for Greg. Thanks, Harry. Um, I've got a few more housekeeping things, so really, thank you for, you know, a beautiful book. Thank you for writing it, actually. Um, and thank you to the audience for participating so enthusiastically in this discussion today. Um, I'd like to recommend you, uh, remind you that the Festival Bookseller, The Bookbird, has a pop-up bookstore on the ground floor, Kikiri Niche, operating all day today and so you can purchase books by all of the local authors featured in the local word including many back copies and previous titles so greg will be signing books on the ground floor over the next 15 minutes or so depending on how long you want to chat to him and for anyone who would like to have their book signed or to purchase either this one do purchase it seriously um, please wait to engage him further because he needs to dash off and, of course, his back titles are available and you can borrow them at the library as well. And today's event has been recorded, so if you'd like to watch or listen to this discussion again or to recommend it to your friends or family, it will be uploaded to the library's YouTube channel within the next couple of days. And finally, can we all please put our hands together to the, for the Geelong Regional Libraries who such a, do such a fantastic job. Enjoy the rest of your day and thank you.